I'm going the old-fashioned sort of watch time thing because, as I've discovered, I'm the oldest out of the um, the three um, there. And as you um, will see through the um, the slide pack, um, the first of I picked um, the first photos black and white because, as you see through the slideshow, my hair gets progressively greyer as um, I'm sort of you know, getting older, and um, the glasses get smaller, so you can sort of start to see the glasses trend through that um, through the um, through the era. So anyway, as we've all sort of focused on a little bit of the journey, and um, you know, you can see, and I had fun dragging down all my old sort of photos of sort of my security photos and that sort of stuff. But yeah, like a lot of people here, you know, I graduated as an engineer. Um, I don't know, how, I didn't see how many hands went up, but that was in 1990, so I think that does make me the oldest out of the, the three. But those who don't actually know, like it's funny, my partner who says he's the real engineer in the family, sort of forgets that I actually did start doing hydraulic modelling and some real engineering sort of when I actually started um, work. Um, so yeah, so you know, I started in the hydraulic modelling group and um, did the 100 year flood mapping of the Yarra River, which is still actually in use today. Um, I then got superintended into the sewerage group to build some of the first Mike 11 sort of models and I know hopefully some of you in the room are still building and using some of those, but I got to build the first ones in Australia and um, with Andrew McGowan and yeah, it was, it was fun, sort of. Um, and many of you may not know, but I suppose at that point in time, although I actually did start with the Board of Works for about nine months, we became Melbourne Water, but the retailers were still connected to Melbourne Water, and we didn't get disaggregated until 1995. So as you can imagine, there was a huge disruption within the organisation. We'd gone from probably 10,000 or even 20, I don't know how big the organisation was, to really a very small um, organisation. And it's really interesting when I reflect through that part of my career, and I suppose I'm reflecting on the, the sort of um, the journey that I've been on. Although there was lots of turmoil in the organisation, I got known for embracing change. I actually don't know whether I would have stayed with Melbourne Water if we weren't going through that change, because when I had been a vacation student and had a, a job in Melbourne Water, it felt bureaucratic, it felt slow and nothing would change. Um, and so I think I was really lucky to join an organisation that was evolving and changing and it allowed me to just take on different opportunities um, and I got known for that and I think that really set me up for, I suppose, a future career in Melbourne Water because I suppose like David's friend, um, I've been, t well it's actually now 27 years in Melbourne Water and I have managed to progress and I've really only stayed in one role for, you know, three years would be my average and some of them are even shorter. So I've managed to actually forge a career in the same organisation. I also wanted to talk about a time where I actually had to make a stand for my career. I think we all sometimes talk about, you know, careers being handed to us on a platter and people sort of sit there and maybe rely on their managers to do something for them or their bosses to do something for them. So some of you may not realise that Melbourne Water actually used to manage the parks as well. Um, so Parks Victoria, or some parts of Parks Victoria were a part of Melbourne Water. I had been seconded out into the sewerage group for whatever reason I was passionate about sewerage. I know <laughs> all my friends laugh at that as well. Um, and my job, my real job, was going to be carved off to Parks Victoria. And I didn't really want to go to Parks Victoria. I was passionate about sewerage. I wanted to do sewerage. Um, but I was being strung along. The manager that I was reporting to on secondment was like, yeah, yeah, we'll find you a job, don't worry, it'll be fine, and time's ticking by and I'm seeing my job in Parks Victoria, sort of, or my job going into Parks Victoria and then me being left out of limbo. So I decided that this wasn't a, a satisfactory position for me to be in, and so it was very much about, well, I need to go back to my old job. If you want me, you create a job and you fight for me. Because at the end of the day, it's your career. I mean, I, I shouldn't say this. Is anybody here working for me? And I have said this. You know. <laughs> um, I'm busy. I, I say, you know, yeah, 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 I'll, look, yeah I'll, I'll try and sort something out. I'll try and sort something out. Now, I don't mean to do that. And I now understand that's what the managers sometimes do. Own your career. Don't sit there. If you feel like you're being strung along by your boss, vote with your feet, is all I can say. Unless you work for me and you're not allowed to do it. <laughs> and, and look, it might 
backfire, but at least you'll actually get some feedback and you won't just be sitting in the same job feeling miserable. You know, a career goes for a long time and you can, there's so many passion, you hear some really passionate stories. There's so many jobs out there, you know, that can really rock your socks. So just, you know, if you're not happy in the one that you've got um, and, you, and, you know, you feel like you need to make a change, then do it. Don't just sit there and wait for your manager to do it. That's it. Unless you wait for me. <laughs> All right, so some more lovely security. You can see our, our logos, our, you know, our um, like brand has changed a little bit through the years as well. So really between 1995 to 2009, it was 14 years, and I really had six jobs within Melbourne Water. You know, an environmental specialist, I then got my first gig as a team leader, um, managing a 24-hour control room, 13 man who told me hell was going to freeze over before a woman worked up there, so I reminded them the hell must have frozen over, um, hence we've got climate change. Um, and then I got to become the team leader of Western Sewage Asset Management. Um, and then there was a little bit of a side shift into a manager of asset information, and I remember when the general manager came to me and he said, oh, I'd like you to head the asset information team, and I'm like, that's GIS, what's that? I'm an engineer. Um, but because my career aspirations were being about I should be able to lead any team, I thought, well, hey, if that's my aspiration, then why would I turn it down? So hence, I embarked on managing an asset information team, I learned a lot more about GIS and IT than I probably ever really wanted to know. And then I was relieved to get back into what I call real engineering work. Um, so I became the manager of M&E Asset Management. Remember, I'm a civil engineer, don't know much about mechanical electrical stuff, but you learn. You, you've got great people who work for you, you ask the right questions, get them to draw pictures. I'm a visual person, so I get them to draw pictures. Um, you know, you can really, if that's what your aspiration is, you should be able to lead any team. I then became the manager of um, civil asset management. And I suppose in my reflection of this sort of period of time, most of my moves are actually driven by organisational change. I was probably lucky, and I'll talk a little bit about advocates later on, that I had a lot of advocates that, that helped me along the way. But I suppose what I did was I embraced every opportunity. So every opportunity that was put in front of me, I grabbed and I took and I ran with it. Um, I really focused on some breadth and depth of experience. So even when I'm looking at people's resumes now, I'm, you know, I do like a little bit of breadth. I like people who have done lots of things in their career, but I also don't want people who sorry moved every year. It's, you know, so some of that, spending some time in a role and gaining some breadth and experience is, is I think, um, valuable. But I suppose one of the, the pivotal moments in my career, and a career-defining moment, was I became the Melwater Incident Controller for the 2009 bushfires. It was a role that I just stepped into and started to lead. It was very much, and I don't think I realised I was doing it, but when I actually sort of came out, you know, two days and I was leading virtually a whole organisation, I'm briefing ministers, I'm briefing boards, um, and I'm not a general manager, and, and I just, my reflection was, I thought, shit, what have I done? And then I thought, well, no one's taken it off me, so I'm going to keep doing it. So I backed myself and just kept on I suppose for nine, well, six weeks of my life, it came consumed with being that incident controller while our catchments were on, on fire. But it was a real career-defining moment because people saw me in that leadership role. And one of my favourite sayings now is, drive it like you stole it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if you get an opportunity, if you're acting like when I got to act as the executive general manager, drive it like you stole it, pretend it's yours, and drive it as though it's yours. And okay, it may not, you know, but just do it. And what, what can you lose? All right, I'll keep moving, otherwise I'm running out of time. Um, my career sort of felt like it stalled. Like, you know, I've been 20, well, how many years that was, 20 years, and I've done all the exciting things, I've been the incident controller, everything's exciting, and I'm like, what's next, what's next, what's next? It was probably the first time in my career where there was nothing really opening up, and you know, it was, it was a pretty tough time. I was really lucky that um, I got to manage Eastern Treatment Plant, but I suppose in my reflections, a lot of people think that was a sideways move. Same level, wasn't a promotion, all that sort of stuff. One of my advice to, to everybody in this room is don't always look for the next step up. Sometimes you have to go sideways to go up. 
um, sometimes you might even have to go down, you know, pay increases and stuff like that. To, so don't just always think of a career as being this, right, my next career has to be bigger and better and all that sort of stuff. It can, it can go sideways. And, and so I suppose that was, you know, here I was sitting in a role in civil assets going, I'm bored, what next? And I was aspiring to do something bigger and better. But really, I needed to take that sideways move to gain some breadth and some experience. And then a general manager's role opened, opened up in 2014, um, because so I became the general manager for wholesale services, asset management services. And then thanks to Dave Ryan, who left to go to City West Water, I got to throw my hat in the ring for the executive general manager of service delivery. But I'd like to actually think that all that foundation that I was laying over that, that all those 26 years or 25 years really set me up for that role. So sometimes careers might feel like they stall, focus on gaining new experience and showing your willingness to learn. And opportunities will open up, but they won't always be perfect timing. So sometimes, you know, I remember, you know, when, I, when the general manager's roles came up, I was like, oh, it's not the right time, I haven't quite finished what I wanted to do at ETP. You just have to grasp them. You can't just sit there, because it may not come up again. So take the opportunities when they, when they come. Nearly finished. Importance of mentoring, education and external experiences. People down in the right hand side, you know, you'll know Lucia. We've sort of done our careers together, you know, for all these years. And I think you know, our lunchtime conversations, even not quite as graduates, but it wasn't too far from sort of, I suppose, um, people in, in, um, in this room. It was just us talking about our careers. And she was a really valuable, you know, people often think of mentors as being people who are older. Sometimes they're just your peers. And, and people are going through similar similar experiences. Um, Grant Wilson, um, Phil Neville and Tony Antonio, I know they're all men, but they've been my advocates in some respects throughout my career. They've opened up opportunities, they've maybe pointed out things and jobs that I would not have applied for and tapped me on the shoulder. So, you know, it's really important to think about mentors and advocates. Um, I get lots of questions about the value of additional education, but additional education does can show others that you're willing to learn. So I do have a Masters of Environmental Science. Um, I haven't done an MBA, I'm not, but you know, a lot of people say, oh, should I do an MBA? I think it's not necessarily it's an MBA, it's just showing people that you're willing to learn and um, experience and have different experiences. And I've just recently done my company director's course, um, which was hard work, actually, since I hadn't studied for a long time. Get involved in the industry. So get connection, that'll help mentor, that will help networks. Um, and because networks are really important. Um, and think about your brand. I can't actually believe I'm saying this, but in the day of now, you, you know, if you're recruit, you've been recruited, people will Google you. So think about the things that you put up or the things that, you know, that you're actually, you know, I've now put myself up for some awards and various other things, well not me, the organisation probably more than anything else, but these are important signatures of your brand and what you stand for going forward, so think about those. Now, like everybody, have some fun along the way. I don't have family photos, but I'm going to show my holiday photos. So paddling the Ardèche in France, hiking in Milford um, in New Zealand, lounging around in India, drinking beer. Um, the Annapurna Circuit, up over 5,000. Um, got to the top and glad to come down. I think that's Lockie's favourite. That was also hiking in, um, in Nepal. Looks like, I didn't even see the um, the axe, so. Um, kayaking in, in Nepal and just reflecting and um, the mountains in, in France. So if all your life is work, I think you, you need to find that balance and it's really important. So think about your career, but have some fun along the way. And that's it.